And by changing the nature of the savannah, you also change the nature of the savannah's wildlife. And it's going to increase the ratio of the grazing animals like the zebra and the wildebeest compared with the browsing animals like impala and giraffe. Though ultimately it's the climate that drives places like Serengeti, over time, humans became a key part in fine-tuning its characteristic nature. By the time the earliest maps started emerging from Victorian explorers of the late 1800s, we can see the extent to which people had begun to dominate the landscape around Serengeti. In the eastern side of our system, we have pastoralists. Now, you can't conduct agriculture on the plains. They cannot support that sort of thing. They're not the right soils, and it's far too dry. So it's really only for pastoralism. In contrast to that, we have agriculturalists in the west. And these people are largely from what's called the Bantu group. And they came from the Congo. They arrived in the 1500s. And in between, the Wanderobo, with a specialism for elephant hunting. The most recent people to arrive in the area have in many ways become the most iconic, the Maasai, arriving from the north of Kenya and Sudan as recently as the 1800s. They later won the respect of the colonials, largely as a result of their fierce warrior reputation. But their success was much more to do with the way they saw their cows and the wild animals of the savannah as part of the same fabric of survival. And for wildlife and Maasai alike, the key to survival here is movement. The Maasai have really perfected the act of making sure that they use the ecosystem in a way that they do not necessarily plead it, but they move about. For instance, they've got a dry season area where they graze the animals during the drought period. They have got an area where they move to when it is rainy. Well, they use the hooves of the cow to cultivate the ecosystem. So without that, more can happen very quickly. It can change to not necessarily a grassy uh, area, but to more of a thicket and bushy that will not have a lot of value for your livestock. So you try to move about so that you can continue balancing the shrubs, the trees, the grasses around your ecosystem. Until this point in the history of the Serengeti, the story was of humans coming to exert more and more control over the landscape and the moving herds. Quite the opposite of the modern picture of a pristine wild Africa. What happened next would change all that. In 1891, an Austrian explorer, Oskar Baumann, was one of the very first Europeans to travel through the Serengeti. His account records first-hand evidence of what turns out to be nothing short of the worst human catastrophe ever to befall the African continent. There were skeleton-like women with the madness of starvation in their sunken eyes. Warriors who could hardly crawl on all fours. They were refugees from the Serengeti, where the famine had depopulated entire districts. What he was describing were the effects of a colonial invasion, not of an army, but of something ultimately much more destructive. A virus called Rinderpest. Rinderpest arrived in Africa, as far as we know, for the first time in 1890. Brought in with cattle from Egypt when the Italians invaded what was called Abyssinia, Ethiopia now. It took six years to spread from Ethiopia to the Cape of Good Hope and to West Africa and killed off 95% of the cattle. With this cattle virus, the whole socio-economic fabric of pre-colonial Africa collapsed. Without meat, without milk, without even the means to pull a plow, Mass starvation quickly followed on a scale matched in global terms only by the Black Death. Parents offered us their babies in exchange for meat. 
Swarms of vultures followed them from high, awaiting their certain victims. Such affliction was from now on, daily before our eyes. I think the reason why Rinderpest was a signature impact is that it swept through Africa so fast. In, in best part of a decade, it moved from Cape to Cairo. And it devastated livestock populations, and therefore it devastated pastoral people. It was much more than a virus. I think it was the loss of a way of life. I think there was a loss of, of, of a certain meaning. If everything you ever imagined life to be suddenly was suddenly swept away and swept away so drastically, um, what else is there to hold on to? And uh, I think it was such a struggle to reconstruct life again. Over the next 20 years, a transformation took hold. Across East Africa, human-mediated grasslands were now swallowed up by the wild African bush. Most critically, just at the time that the colonial scramble for Africa was reaching out into the remotest parts of the dark continent. The impact of Rinderpest was to create the impression among the incoming explorers and the administrators that the savannas had very few people. And I think the unfortunate thing is that that was true for that time. But looked at in the bigger historical picture, going back maybe 200 years, these would have been prime areas. And they would be prime areas again once the populations of people and livestock built up again. So we were looking at a very low ebb ecologically for the relationship between people and wildlife. And it had a huge bearing on the way in which conservation went and the perception, or let's say the misperception, that the colonial governments, and I would say even the independent governments, had on the role of people in the savannas. With the shutting out of the local people from the landscape, the way was now open for a completely new vision of the African savanna. Wild, savage and pristine. It is the strong attraction of the silent places, of the large tropic moons and the splendor of the new stars, where the wanderer sees the awful glory of sunrise and sunset in the wide waste spaces of the earth. Unworn of man, and changed only by the slow change of the ages through time everlasting. In April 1909, ex-US President Theodore Roosevelt arrived on the shores of East Africa for his now famous safari. Theodore Roosevelt was probably America's greatest conservation president. During his administration, the largest amount of public lands uh, was set um, in forest reserves um, and national parks than probably any other president since. 